Yesterday I was at my school. After forty-five years I went back to my school. How does it feel? How do you think? So I went there and uh, I was just telling them my experience of school. When I went to school, you know this monthly uh, marks card, when I said monthly, don't think I'm talking menstrual cycles or something. I'm talking about monthly marks card, it almost felt like that for a lot of people <laughs> because that's how they went through it. When this marks card comes, when the teacher gives it to them, some look at it and they're strutting around because they are first, second, whatever. Some are sitting in one corner and crying because they're not happy with the numbers that they got. I never opened the mox card in my entire school. When they gave it to me, I took it and gave it to my father. He blew. <laughs> I couldn't understand why just this card. I never opened it and saw because I thought this is a transaction between my teacher and him. <laughs> I had no… <laughs> I had no interest in it whatsoever. So I never bothered, but I always saw it. My father is a well-educated, intelligent man, but uh, it disturbed him. For three days he blew like a volcano. Looking at this yellow card, they always give a yellow colored card. Still like that? <laughs> so, I was wondering three days volcanic experience he's having. Why I'm saying this is, we have set this kind of things. We can't change the entire system tomorrow morning, but we can change ourselves, how we handle this, isn't it? Why is it so important that you have to be ahead of somebody. Why? Why is it so important? Is it not important your life should be beautiful, hmm? You must be joyful, you must be wonderful, you must explore your full potential. Is this important or you want to be better than somebody sitting next to you? Well, if what's sitting next to you is a piece of dung, you will be a little better dung, <laughs> yes? <laughs> That's not how life should end up. So don't blame yourself for uh, anybody's suffering. They're like that, they're practiced, you know, just many have become veterans in suffering because uh, they're acclimatizing themselves to go to hell. <laughs> Acclimatization process. They want to make themselves such a suffering here, even if you drop them in hell, it'll feel wonderful. <laughs> You… you… you never blame yourself for somebody's misery, okay? It's all right. What to do? It's individual choice, huh? Yes or no? Outside people, what can we do? What can I do to you? I can create an easy situation or a difficult situation for you. Suffering is your business, isn't it? Yes or no? Suffering is your business. Either you can be a challenging child for your parents, I wish you will be, because otherwise they will become like Bishibale Bhatta. <laughs> you must be a little challenging for them. So whether they enjoy the challenge or suffer, the challenge is left to them. Am I… is it okay? <laughs> because uh, what I see is, it doesn't matter how many arrangements you make, those who suffer anyway suffer, isn't it? Just… just see the Western countries as an example. What everybody is dreaming of or what even people don't dare to dream here, an average American citizen has. You think they're all bursting with joy? All the arrangements have been made. You think they're bursting in joy? No misery, forty-two percent of population over forty-five is on you know, psychiatric medication. So this is not joy for sure, even mental health is not being managed because just making external arrangements is not going to fix this life. It's very, very important that you make inner arrangements that even if they send you to hell, you will go joyfully. You heard of Gautama, the Buddha? You heard of Buddha? 
When everybody was talking about going to heaven, Gautama said, what will I go and do in heaven? Because you say everything is wonderful there, what will I do there? Let me go to hell. Because you say everybody is suffering there, let me go and do something because anyway I cannot suffer. I made myself like this, I cannot suffer, so let me go to hell. Even now the Buddhist texts talk about Buddha being in the lower world. Well, you should have this kind of freedom, isn't it so? Huh? Even if I go to hell, I will live well. Nobody has to send me to heaven. You can go to the next question. There, please, if possible. This is a cricketing country, you can throw it, he will catch it. So my question is, we students sitting over here are among the top percentile in the country in terms of education that we are receiving. Yet all of us are wondering about what jobs we will get, we just want the best campus placements over here. If that's the scenario with, the, with all of us and we are not willing to take risks and have become risk averse, from where will the jobs come for the country when we are not thinking about starting our own ventures, our own startups, our own firms? Where we also have our NSR cell here, which incubates startups in Am Bangalore. <laughs> Incubation is only for an unhatched egg. <laughs> now, uh, see, India is a developing country. Is that so? What a developing country means is, so much is still undone, many, many things to be done. In this country, nobody should be talking about unemployment, if you ask me, because there is so much to be done. Now the problem is, you want only that certain kind of job where you will get the maximum pay without doing the needed work. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, it's a developing country. There are million things yet to be done in this country. This is not a developed country, what shall I do, everything is done. No, there are too many things yet to be done. So, if you have a working brain and a seeing eye, if you look around, there are thousand things to be done right around you, isn't it? So, I don't think you should be looking in terms of campus placement. The word placement sounds like you're in a hospice. <laughs> this should not be the attitude of the youth. What are you going to lose if you take a risk? I'm asking, what are you going to lose? Your friend may get into McKenzie, is that it? <laughs> That's not the way to look at life. There is so much to be done in the world. If you have the brains and the guts to do something, there is so much to be done in this world, isn't it? Particularly in India. So, I would like to see from this institution that uh, little more dare in you, nothing will happen. You are not in that condition like uh, the little girl expressed, even she is not that if I don't do this, I will fall on the street, I will become a beggar. <laughs> no, that will not happen to you. Are you sure about that or no? That will not happen to you. Uh, but if you are enterprising, can, you think the world can stop you? No, the world will put obstacles in your way. Either you can see them as obstacles or you can see them as possibilities always. Where there is a problem, there is a possibility, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. Wherever there is a problem, there is a possibility. That is, if you start looking, what's the solution for this problem? If you just see the problem and you don't think beyond that, that a problem is a great possibility because if you solve this, that's it. There are lots of problems in our country. Please see how to solve it, that's what you should invest in. <laughs> Namaskar.
Namaste. Namaste. Uh, my name is Danya Ravi. Mm -hmm. And firstly, I would love to express my gratitude to Sadhguruji for establishing Isha Foundation and Isha, Isha Music. Because for me, music heals a lot. That's one of the tools I use uh, whenever I come across any problem. And there is no day that goes by without listening to Isha music. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to you for that. And <laughs> yeah, so talking about my health condition, I'm born with a rare genetic disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, commonly known as brittle bone disease, which means my bones are extremely fragile, just like a glass. And I face more number of fractures than the number of bones in anyone's body. So today, I, more than a question, I have a humble wish. I'm a regular follower of your everyday saying. So it would be nice if one of the coming days, if you could quote something about disability, as I believe uh, this opportunity would create a wider visibility for survivors of people with disability. And yeah, I would be happy if that quote is done along with our pick. <laughs> along with? Our pick. <laughs> photograph. Oh, photograph. We will. Yeah, along yes, with sir. our photograph. Swami if you take a good picture. No, I need you and me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, Uh, please, this is this is entirely for uh, my request for this is entirely for spreading awareness about rare yes. diseases because uh, it's only through awareness it can be controlled. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much. And yeah, Sadhguruji, I'm hoping it happens sometime very soon. <laughs> very soon. Thank you. <laughs> it's our privilege to have you here. <laughs> Well, with another question, your maybe. Oh, sorry, sir. Of course. Sorry, yes. <laughs> See, different people have different types of disabilities. <laughs> And I will do that, we will do that. Uh, see, uh, life has come in so many forms, but societies have decided what is normal and what is not normal. But actually, if we compare every one of you who have all the four limbs intact and whatever, you compare to the next person, in some aspect of life, are you not disabled? Hmm? If you run with Mr. Bolt, won't you feel like a cripple? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> with two good legs, won't you feel like a cripple? Yes. So let's not uh, brand ourselves or anybody else one way or the other because life has come in so many ways. You just have to respect that and do your best about it. Because it's a miracle in the sense, just now Sesang was talking about the miracle that he did today morning, that he makes ragi dosa into a human being. <laughs> Isn't it a miracle? And this ragi dosa was made with the soil that we walk upon, yes or no? Hmm? Just the soil which became food and food which became flesh and bone. In such a phenomenally complex process which we have taken for granted, unfortunately, certain things sometimes don't… did not work the way we think it should be. So, never call yourself disabled. Well, you're one way, I'm another way. I am disabled in one way, you are disabled in another way. Some way, every one of us, if we compare ourselves to somebody, all of us are disabled in some sense, isn't it? But 
See what an intelligent mind you have. And because of that, we're going to have a court. <laughs> I'm saying, bones are breaking, it's painful, unfortunate. But mo most people who… who are being labeled as normal, they're all breaking up their brains every day. Hmm? Not bones, brains. They call it stress, they call it anxiety, they call it so many things. But uh, literally, breaking up the brain, isn't it, in some way. The whys and whats are not necessary because we need to understand the physical form is a mechanical process. Sometimes things will go wrong with it. It may come normal and go wrong or in the very womb manufacturing something can go wrong. This has got nothing to do with that person. It's got something to do with variety of things because it's such a complex process. Such a complex process that something little off sometimes. But that should not determine what and how you live because how we live physically may be determined by many things. But how we live within ourselves, nobody can decide except us, isn't it? Hmm? Nobody else can decide how I live within myself. So in that sense, nobody is disabled. Why spiritual process is very important is because in body, no person can claim he has a perfect body because somebody else could be in some other way. If it comes to mind, nobody can claim that they have a perfect mind. All of us disabled in some way physically, mentally compared to somebody else, isn't it? But a dimension which is beyond this physiology and psychology, the psychological and the physiological dimensions, beyond this, that dimension which we unfortunately have to use this corrupted word called spirituality, in this state, our life is just same. The reason and the significance of why a spiritual process must be prevalent across the planet is, spiritual process does not mean looking up or looking down, it's about turning inward and touching a dimension beyond our physiological and psychological structures. In this state, there is simply no difference between you and me and anybody and anybody. This is why it becomes significant. We can talk about equality as much as we want, but when we use our body or physical presence as the front end, there is no equality. Do what you want. If we use our mind as the front end, no equality. Do whatever you want. One is like that, one is like this, one is like that. This is how it is. But if we use this dimension of life which is beyond our body and mind, these two accumulations of body and mind. Beyond this, if you look, here everything is same. If this one experience enters humanity, you will find a very fabulously inclusive existence here. Doesn't matter who has come with what capability or not, everything, every life will have a place. But right now, we are setting standards based on physiological and psychological competence and saying, this is standard, this is substandard. No, don't do that because can you say a carrot is a lesser life than you? Hmm? Or a grasshopper is a lesser life than you? Because they can live without you, you cannot live without them. That's a fact, isn't it? They can very easily live without you, but you cannot live without them. Nature has given us this possibility that today we have the intelligence to be above all this life. But when you rise to a certain level, it's very important if you're a crude nonsense, you will think this is a time to dominate. Or if you rise to a certain level, 
where the rest of the life knowingly or unknowingly is looking up to you, this is a time to include and merge with everything. This is not a time to dominate, isn't it? Because once you dominate, you alienate from everything. I'm telling you because you're all going to be managers. If you want to manage people, I was uh, teaching a three-day program to one of the top companies in the world, twenty-five top managers of that company, an international giant. They were about thirty-five people, or uh, twenty-five people, and uh, our volunteers were about nine volunteers, so we were doing this program. Our volunteers are like made like this day and night. The basic qualification is you're crazy, you know. That means you're not thinking what will happen to you, what will I get? Nobody is thinking, simply they're working their life out. So they saw them like this and said, Sadhguru, where do you get such people? Because these are companies which are always looking for attrition. I said, you don't get them, you got to make them. How do you… how do you make such people? I said, you should make them fall in love with you. Oh, because once they're in love with you, they will do whatever is needed. Now, how do you make them fall in love with us? I said, first you must fall in love with them. And I said, oh, they don't pay us for that. <laughs> so once you try to dominate, you alienate. Once you alienate, it's hell to manage people, it's hell. It's better you take sannyas and live somewhere alone because managing even one person when they're alienated from you is hell. In inclusion, management will happen effortlessly. So this inclusion has to come means human life or human beings have to come to at least a little bit of inner experience which is beyond body, which is beyond mind because when it comes to body, your body is different, my body is different. Do what you want, this will stay different. We will think it's different at least, as long as we live, only when they bury us, we know it's all the same soil. When you compare mentally, my mind is different, your mind is different, do what you want, they will always remain different. But if you look at this as life, there is no such thing as my life and your life. This is a living cosmos. The question is only how much of life did you capture in this? This is all that matters. It's not the size of the body, it's not the size of your brain. How much life did you capture within yourself will determine the scale and scope of life. How big a life you live simply depends on how much life have you captured. So if you want to capture more life than you have right now, the simple thing that you have to know, do is, you must open up the boundaries of your individuality. Your individuality is slowly becoming a concrete shell that nobody can break through. If you obliterate the boundaries of your individuality, then we say this is yoga. Yoga does not mean twisting your body, turning upside down, wearing lulu pants, Yoga means union. Union means the boundaries of your individuality, consciously you obliterate it. Now, there is a life larger than anybody can imagine happening within you. Because of a large-scale life, everything will come naturally your way. You don't have to go and set up your shop in a busy place. Wherever you set up, they will come. They cannot help. I must tell you this from experience, in continuation we're talking, okay? <laughs> when uh, we want to set up the yoga center, I went and chose a place which had no road, which is just right next to the rainforest and it's remote as it can get. It's a proper uh, revenue land, but remote, nobody would want to go there. When I said this, this is where I want to set up the yoga center. We had a trust, 
is a foundation. Out of six trustees, four of them dropped out because they thought, I'm crazy. They wanted to find a five-acre plot inside the city or just next to the city, start a center where people will come. They said, nobody is going to come, this man has lost his mind. Well, today it's become one of the most prominent places in the country, in the world, actually. <laughs> Similarly, in United States, we went and set up a center in the remotest possible place in Tennessee. People said, Sadhguru, this is not the place to go. Tennessee is a different kind of place. It's a very uh, strong religious place, extreme, Bible Belt. It's Sadhguru, you don't know, just the previous year, they'd burned down a Zen meditation center. Sadhguru, this happened, you don't go there. I said, see, Beaver, this was all in the northern area in Michigan. So I said, see, I know how to transform people, but I don't know how to change the weather. So I go Tennessee. <laughs> and they said, why in such a remote place? I said, see, I don't know how you look at it. I looked at this map of United States. I drove across, crisscrossed United States just to look at the terrain and the temperatures and things. Then I said, this is the place. I looked at the map and said, this is where, because if I draw a twelve-hour drive kind of circle, sixty percent of United States population is around us. I said, this is where I will be in the remote, remote place, because it's so remote, we bought over two thousand acres and today it's a buzzing center. Uh, why I'm saying all this to you is because for a low-hanging fruit, you live a low-hanging life, simply because something seems to be easy right now. But if you are very clear what you want to create, whether it's a business or an industry or you just want to make yourself… Above all, what kind of human being do you want to become? That's the most important thing. Don't start any enterprise or job, all these things are on the side. The real thing is, what kind of life will this become? This is the real thing, isn't it? If you just focus on this one thing, if you obliterate your boundaries of your individuality, you will see this will become a large-scale life. When it becomes a large-scale life, everything that happens around you will be of a certain scale, naturally. Of course, some things are decided by times in which we live. If you were an IT professional a thousand years ago, you wouldn't know what to do, isn't it? So, there are times <laughs> Uh, Namaste Sajguruji. Uh, the question is that uh, you have spoken about to live the life uh, considering there's no goals. So my question was that how to l experience the life like which, which you spoke till now, uh, there are no goals and you have to just experience, you have to elevate yourself. So I wanted to know how to experience your life. So how do I experience my life? You don't have to do anything to experience, experience is happening all the time, isn't it? The question is only whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. Hello? Is some experience happening right now? Yes. Experience is happening to you through five senses right now by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. This is the way your experience is happening. If you observe this experience, it's not really reliable to know life. It's reliable enough for survival process, but it's not reliable enough to know because everything that you know through your five sense organs is only by comparison. That is why this whole business of comparing yourself to somebody, because senses can only know by comparison. You know what's light only because there is darkness, isn't it? You know what's big only because you've seen something small. So everything is by comparison. When you know everything by comparison, it's all right for survival, but it's not good enough to know life. So about knowing life will not happen if your perception is limited to five senses. It needs to go beyond that. Only when that happens, your boundaries of your individuality are taken away. And that's when life happens in large proportions. 
I think you're trying to make a philosophy of what you heard, that's a big problem. Don't draw a conclusion. I came here to see that I can remove some conclusions in your mind so that you're a open life. But you're trying to draw a conclusion, what is the takeaway? No takeaway. Don't take away anything. Just… just walk out into the world little more conscious and alive, that's the thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>